Hey there, students. Of all the games I've shown you so far, I think this is the one I'm most excited about and most impressed by, because Nicholas Fierderu is not only one of the world's strongest international masters, but he's also the first true expert of the modern mainline of the Karakhan with free D3. In fact, I checked his chess.com games and he's had this position after E4, C6, Knight F3, D5 and D3 in over 140 of his games. So I think that itself tells you he is the first true expert of this opening. His results were very good, even against many strong grandmasters. And this game, I think the favorite of his examples I found from, uh, from his games, where he just outplays a 2600 grandmaster very convincingly, where Black makes some mistakes that sort of don't look like mistakes at first glance, but after Fyodor's very precise play, Black was just really struggling throughout and never really was able to find his feet, you could say. So let's study this game in more detail, especially since it also features the main line, which is with Queen takes d1 and our knight to... Sorry, it's not with knight f6 actually in a game Shimanov played. The move knight d7 instead. Uh, it's a good one to address because we've only covered it very, very briefly in the fear equal section. And where I mentioned that at a4 would probably be my preference, but I think in second place would be Fyodor's line over knight fd2, which is basically inviting a transposition back into the knight gf6 lines that we saw in one of the previous games. I think it was the uh, Danielson. Ah, uh, no, it was the. Uh, okay, I've forgotten exactly which game it was now. I was at Dorov against Villegas game. That was the one where we saw this possible transposition. But in this game, Black played a little bit differently. Uh, if he does play a move like g6 with ideas of bishop to h6, well, actually, this is quite a, uh, a tricky way for Black to play. And it may be one argument against knight fd2 that Black can go for an early bishop h6, say with f3, and you know, even bishop h6 here as a possible candidate. Though maybe the plan is a bit less effective with Black already committed to knight d7, perhaps. Though maybe a better way for players Black... A better way of black play might just be, say, bishop g7. And, you know, f5 could be a way to get good counterplay in the center. Though I do feel after takes and takes that even though a 2700 GM lost this position as white with king c2, I think if white plays knight b3 or even knight c4 instead, then you do have some small chances to fight for an edge in unbalanced position. Though with black having a central majority, I imagine he should objectively be quite okay as well. I mean, if g6, I guess the other options are to play some other moves, like maybe knight c3 or knight c4, but f3 does feel the most consistent with knight fd2 in terms of the overall strategy. So, in any case, instead of that, uh, black played the move e5. And I think that e5 was actually a strategic mistake already, because while it worked quite well against knight bd2 and bishop e3, knight d2 subs, because black could trade off the bishops quickly, with bishop c5. I think the e5 plan is a lot less effective here in comparison because after f3, black sort of has this problem that, well, for one thing, his bishop really struggles to find a good square from c8. And it's very easy for white just to build up the position with quite natural moves and kind of ask black, well, what is your plan in this position? Uh, black played the move of bishop d6, which I think is fairly natural. I mean, if black plays knight c5, white can just go a4 and you know, the knight all looks a little bit silly on uh, c5 in a position like this. You know, if they go bishop e6, you have bishop c4 even to, again, achieve that desirable trade of the uh, light squared bishops I've talked about before. So black played bishop d6 instead, but the problem with that is that then after a4, white will have knight c4 with a tempo to kick the bishop around. Indeed, after knight gf6, white could very well have played this if he wanted with a normal knight c4. But white's approach in the game was also quite interesting, where he just played c3 and just slowly improved his position and kind of kept the option of whether to play knight c4 or knight b3, depending on black's next moves. Uh, the computer actually has a soft spot for playing b3 and going for bishop a3 to try to get the knights around. Though it strikes me as being a little bit unnatural, I'm not sure if I entirely agree with it. I think the way that Fyodor played was much more natural. So after castles, white played king c2, and 
I mean, maybe castling wasn't the most precise. You know, I think that the king maybe is a little healthier on e7. Uh, though maybe he was worried about some b3 and bishop a3 check in that case. But in any instance, I think white is clearly better in his position. And after bishop c7... Well, bishop c7 is aimed against knight c4, which you know, would have been a good reply to most black moves. But now that black has retreated, we kind of know, well, knight c4 doesn't really do all that much. Since with white, after only having two pieces past the first rank... It's not like we're in a position to jump a knight into d6 very quickly, like we saw in some previous games. So what Fyodoro did was he played the move knight to b3. It's true you could also make a case for a5 and going for the queenside expansion. But knight b3 is kind of nice and it just stops the knight coming to c5. I mean, black doesn't have knight b6 either because of a5. So it's just very hard for black to even get his c8 bishop developed in a logical way. Uh, also means with the knight on b3, we don't have to worry about any bishop a6 ideas against the knight on c4. You, know, you can play bishop e3 and you know, set up ideas like playing a5 later to create some weaknesses in black's structure. Or if black plays a5, try and stop that. Then we can certainly bring our knight towards c4 and put some pressure on the black uh, dark squares. Again, it's a very unpleasant position where you, know, you could even imagine, magic, imagine white expanding on the king's side as well and just grabbing space on that flank it's one of these positions where i think the computer actually underestimates the level of strategic danger black is in because none of black's piece placements really make a lot of sense to me at the moment they don't really harmonize into a clear plan so in the game black played rook d8 which i think may have been a little bit imprecise because it gives white options like a5 where you know it makes it much harder for black to get in b6 as after AB6, obviously black can't keep his structure solid and take back with a pawn. So I think A5 was slightly more precise, but Knight A3 also kept a very pleasant advantage. Black played the move B6. I think maybe Knight F8 was more consistent with Rook D8, where at least it allows you to get your bishop developed and at least enter the middle game. Though it is true that black would still have problems. And even a move like Bishop G5 could be a little annoying with the idea of potentially doubling the pawns later. Just to mess up black's pawn structure on the king side. Well, in the game we had b6. Uh, white played bishop e3. And the rest was just sort of very smooth on white's part. You know, with bishop e2. Knight e6. White played rook hd1. So it's quite nice he's not wasting time on unnecessary pawn moves. But just playing to get all of his pieces to good squares. Uh, black played move rook d1. Which it might seem like a concession to give up the open d file and... Maybe it is a slight concession, although if white not having any entry points anyway, I think it's not that big of a deal. But still, maybe I would have preferred to play bishop b7 or g6. And you just don't give white the option to play knight c4 and knight d6 later. Well, after takes and takes, black played king to f8. Again, maybe bishop d7 was a better try. And actually, I'm really impressed with the move that Fyodoro played as white, where he showed a very good understanding of the position in terms of how to exploit some of the weaknesses on black's queen side. If you want, you can try to find this move yourself for white, where the invitation is always there, to see if you can find a move before I say it. So, the answer is that white played this move of knight c1, and from a computer perspective, there are a lot of good moves for white. So the difference between, say, knight c1 or knight c4, or knight d2 may not seem all that great. But the difference lies in the strategy behind it. Where white is ready now to put the knight on b4 and put a lot more pressure against the c6 pawn that's been weakened. And actually that's the plan that was realized in the game with king e7. Uh, white played knight d3. Admittedly b4 might be more precise just to support ideas like, uh, for example, a b5 or a5 push to you know use our more active piece placement to open the position in our favor. But knight d3 was played instead, which is also a move that makes sense. I mean, maybe black should play bishop b7 and you know, just try to complete his development would seem the most natural try. That is true, the bishop is very badly placed in his structure due to the white uh, light squared pawn chain. In the game, black tried knight d7, but the problem with that is that after knight b4, it's not that easy to defend this c6 pawn in a comfortable way. Because if you play the natural bishop to b7, you get hit with the move bishop a6, and white achieves the aim of trading off the uh, good black bishop 
well, I'm not sure it's a good piece, but let's say the better bishop for the structure. And after takes and say rook c8, you know, it's just very easy for white to build up the pressure. You know, moves like knight c4 and... Well, there are a few different plans, like you can go b4 and a5 to increase the pressure here. But you can also even just expand on the king side as well and just bide your time and... Don't make the case that black doesn't have an easy way to untangle. Because, I mean, if he tries to play knight b8, that has the problem that he loses the e5 pawn to a mini combination. So... That explains why black played knight b8, but at the same time when you undevelop the knight and leave all these queenside pieces undeveloped, it's clear that this has really gone very wrong for black. So white played knight c4, you know, we don't have to worry about bishop a6. And I mean, if black does play some waiting move, like let's say f6, like even moves like knight d5 can be a way to transform the position. And I'm not sure if I would play it right at this moment, but it's idea that it's worth mentioning that with this fork you can potentially open the position at the right moment, uh, perhaps after some of our preparatory moves like g3, h4, and you know, maybe even bishop f1 to h3 can be an idea at the right moment. So if they go bishop b7, just to keep the pressure that way. Uh, so in the game, black played bishop d7, and b3, I mean, is maybe not the absolute most precise move, but is a very solid choice that says, well, okay, I'll just improve my position slightly, and make the case that black doesn't have a useful move. I mean, the fact that the computer wants to play bishop c8 uh, is already a sign that things have gone quite wrong for black here. Uh, I'm not really sure what the idea of bishop c8 is, to be honest. Maybe to go back to b7, but it kind of feels wrong. You know, even just g3 is, I think, quite a, a good reply, you know, with the usual ideas that I, uh, you know, I mentioned before. So after f6, white played g3 once again, you know, just stopping any knight f4 business and potentially preparing an f4 break. Oh, black played bishop e8, trying to improve his piece placement that way. Though I feel like the bishop maybe is actually worse on f7 than it was on d7, funnily enough. I mean, it's one of the problems that you have when you try to defend these positions as black is that almost anything you do to try to change your piece placement will almost certainly make it worse, just due to the sheer extent of the domination of white's pieces over black's. Like, I mean, if you play a5, for example, you're just weakening the b6 square very severely or b6 pawn very severely so in the game black played h6 kind of admitting his position's already bad after bishop f1 and if black plays g5 try and stop f4 then you know it does give a big f5 outpost so black played knight f8 in the game and white continued with the move f4 which on the one hand might be slightly impatient you, know, you could certainly play moves like bishop f2 and maybe you know, try and bring the knight to f5 before going for f4 plans. But at the same time, black's position is quite poor and... Well, it's not the worst moment to expand, let's put it this way. Because, I mean, if black does take, it just helps white to play bishop f4 and... Well, I mean, once you get your knight to d6 like this, it's just a very tough position. Because the knight can also jump to f5. And still black can't develop his b8 knight because of the pressure here which also leaves the rook completely out of play. And I mean, a uh, move like bishop uh, c4 is a big concession as well, to give up your good bishop. But if you let white get in, say, f5 or something, then... I mean, white just has all the space, and, you know, eventually g4, g5 is going to create more weaknesses in black's position, and, you know, I think in the long term, black will not be able to resist the sheer amount of space and pressure that white has. I mean, it's really quite a big factor, actually, in this position that... Because black still has all the minor pieces on the board, it means that the space to advantage him cripples him much more than it might say if the position was more simplified. So after knight fd7, white played bishop h3, just hitting the knight. Apparently the best move for black is bishop e6, but it's kind of like admitting that a position is strategically close to lost if you're trading off your one best piece like this. So black tried bishop e8 and... You know, white drifted slightly, but didn't really spoil things all that much. You know, I think that a move like, uh, say, rook d2 or king c2, and maybe even just a plan to bring the king to the king side to support the pawn storm could be quite interesting. Though maybe it does allow knight c5, which maybe is worth avoiding. I don't think it's all that scary, personally. Well, white played knight d3 instead, just to, you know, control the squares and keep the pressure on e5. Where he basically wants to keep these knights bottled up. 
it does allow Black to play Bishop A, Knight A6, and he can at least, you know, return the pawn to complete his development. I think that probably was, practically speaking, the best try for Black. Uh, instead, you, he played the move B5, which, well, I guess I can understand this desire to break free at the earliest opportunity, but ultimately it just creates more weaknesses. And after A, B5, C, B5, and Knight A3, well, already Black is, you know, has this weak pawn on B5. He defended it with A6, but then after Knight B4, the Knight is ready to jump into D5, which is just a magnificent outpost for the Knight. Uh, the game continued with Bishop F7, and here White found a nice trick to actually just win the game almost on the spot. Again, it's a good opportunity to see if you can find it as well. Because uh, certainly a normal move like Knight D5 and takes does keep a winning position. Because I mean, Black's Knights are just really, well, struggling to do anything productive. But the winning move, or the most winning move, is to play Knight C6. Obviously, Knight C6 and Rook D7 wins a piece. But after King E8, White just took on C8 on B8. And now the key move and... Like, personally, I really like these collinear moves where you put the bishop right in their face. And with bishop c8, the threat of bishop b7 is just one that can't really be effectively parried. Uh, the game concluded with ef4, gf4, bishop h5, rook to d2, black plate a5, sort of a desperation. You know, bishop b7 does win the exchange, but first white took the pawn on b5, hitting the bishop. And then after bishop b7, black resigned because he's just losing far too much material to uh, survive. So there you are. This was a very instructive game by the first true master of the modern mainliner Karakhan, Nicholas Fyodorou. Uh, if you want to look up his games on chess.com, his chess.com username is Kriari. So that's K-R-I-A-R-I. -R -I -R -I. And that will give you a really good feel for how to play these positions and... Because they're also mostly blitz games, they give a very clear demonstration, much like this one, of sort of the typical way in which black might make mistakes and how white can punish them. So of all the different experts I mentioned, I think he's actually the best one to study. Just say all his chess.com games and you're in pretty good stead for understanding some of the finer details of these lines. Of course it's true, lots of other strong players have played these positions as well. And actually in the next game I will show you a game where Dmitry Andre can actually crush a player in the Chinese chess league in just 29 moves using this uh, this D3 system. In fact, it's a game that's very instructive because it shows a typical way that the pawn structure can transform. And it's the sort of game that reminds me of why openings like the Rossolimo are so popular nowadays and a somewhat similar structure arises in this game as well. So I'll see you there, students.